Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, what an extraordinary thing that those who are the vilest offenders would find mercy and grace in your extraordinary kindness and mercy and grace to us. Now, Father, we thank you that you're a God who condescends to speak to us, for we are unworthy of any conversation with you, and yet in your love you do speak, and you speak to us today in your word as you do week by week. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that all our stubborn hearts might give way to your sovereignty and that we might bow the knee before you, listen carefully to what you have to say to us and respond with obedience and faith. Now, Father, may we do all this to your glory and your praise, for you are indeed worthy of these things. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, July 30th, um, I was away on holidays on long service leaves, leave overseas and I received an email uh, somewhere between France and Norway. Um, I kind of watch my emails while I'm away because when you're the bishop, you need to make sure that the clergy aren't misbehaving. Um, and this was the request that came by email. Could you preach on Titus 3 verses 12 to 15 and I said well, of course and then I went and looked up the passage which begins as soon as I send Artemis and Tychicus to you do your best to come to me in Nicopolis because I've decided to winter there do everything you can to help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need Now I ask you, you, uh, what would you do with a passage like this? I should be thankful that Tim asked me to at least teach the Bible. But I have to say that having thrown me this ball, he is conspicuously absent this morning. <laughs> But don't be fooled by my introduction, friends. Uh, you've been journeying through the letter of Titus uh, together and we come to the conclusion of that letter. Uh, the church in Crete is a pretty new one as far as I can tell when Paul writes to Titus. It's, and Paul writes to Titus to put in place a leadership and an inspired laity that will shape the church as God's people in the world of which they are a part. In Paul's earlier letters uh, to Timothy, there's a whole lot going on with false teaching and having to guard the gospel, and they're very intimate conversations that happen with Timoth Timothy. That's not unimportant in Crete, the whole idea of false teaching for Titus, with its empty and deceitful talkers and divisive people. But I want to suggest to you it's not the big issue for Titus. It is as though the letter from Paul is to see the church focus on the main game and not get distracted from what the main game is. The issue for Titus is establishing the establishment of the church in a setting where all cretins are liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. That's the context. A little bit like church planting in an Australian context. That was a deliberate pause. It's one thing to ask how would you preach on uh, chapter 3 verses 12 to 15 here in Titus, but I have to say it's quite another thing to think about how you're going to establish a church in a part of the world that is like Crete. And without losing the opportunity, it's worth asking the question, why is the world, or in this case Crete, important when thinking about establishing the church? important question. 
would be a shame really if I had to tell you, but I'm going to anyway. The church has a mission, a mission to the world or a Crete that is going to hell. It is not a place for us to escape from the world on Sunday, a church, but rather a place from which we go into the world to minister Christ from. It is established, of course, the church on the missioner, Jesus Christ, the great missioner, the one referred to in chapter 3 of this letter and verse 4, which is worth hearing again. See it there, verse 4. But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He's the great missioner and we are... We have been the recipients of that mission and you and I have been changed by that mission, I hope. Of course, all this raises a really good question for an established church, doesn't it? Because we're talking about the new church of Crete, but it raises a question for the established church. What have we become? What have we become as you think about Titus? Do we need to think again about who we are and what church should be like in Narrabri? I imagine Tim's been constantly doing that through all the years of his ministry here, constantly having us ask the question, what have we become? Do we need to think again about who we are as the church here in Narrabri? And I dare say when the new minister comes, He will ask the same questions and get us thinking about the same things. Well, Titus offers some tips. It's very easy for a long-established church to find itself bruised and battered by the likes of those that you'll see in chapter 3, verse 9, who are quarrelsome and divisive. Notice what Paul says about such people. He says they are unprofitable and worthless. Is that a little harsh, do you think? Is that a little harsh? Paul's just called them unprofitable and worthless. That's fairly strong, isn't it? I don't think it's too harsh when you consider that the context of establishing Christ's church in the world, in that context, such people prove very unprofitable and worthless to the church's mission to the world. That's exactly what they are. They distract people from the mission and they take, they take time to deal with, don't they, divisive and quarrelsome people. They distract from the mission and the time they take to deal with that, with the time you, they take for you to deal with them is time lost to our ministry in the world. And I want to underline this with you. It's very simple. If you're taking notes, I'm going to describe them in only six words. Actually, I can describe them in three words, but the sentence is six. They are simply bad for business. What are they? They are bad for business. Now, while it's not crystal clear who these quarrelsome and divisive people are, it is worth reflecting on who they could likely be, or even in a modern sense, who might actually fit the picture. False teachers who simply have the mind of their own and not the mind of Christ come immediately to mind. People with an axe to grind, not a cross to carry, could easily fit the picture. Know those kind of people? There's a few mmms there. It's a pity that you know those kinds of people. The squeaky wheel lacking the oil of servant-hearted love is definitely distracting. And then there are those who seek therapy from church but not transformation. There are those who want respectability by attendance at church but are antagonistic to what makes church respectable to God. Of course, Christians are 
human, aren't they? And we do need help from time to time. And the Bible makes very clear that we must love the people of the household of God, mustn't we? And it means that we're going to have to be pastorally sensitive and pastorally caring of one another. But I don't think Paul's really talking about that kind of person when he talks about those who are quarrelsome and divisive, unprofitable and worthless. No, he's talking about people who we all know are what? Bad for business. And what is the business? What is the business of the letter of Titus? Well, you could go back to chapter 1, verse 1, which is a purpose clause, where we're told that Paul the Apostle is about the knowledge of truth that leads to godliness. So we're on about that business. Of course, godliness doesn't come aside from the truth, does it? Truth leads to godliness. Okay, I want to make that, I want to make a point, and I haven't written this down, which is always dangerous. My wife's smirking at this point. My unwritten points are always the most dangerous ones, but often they're the ones that sit the longest. We live in a world that kind of wants everything to restart. We've blurred and confused almost everything in the area of human sexuality and a whole range of other things. The church is not into restarting. The church is in a constant state of reformation. But when you talk about reformation and you think about reforming, you've got to reform back to what your original intention was. So as a church of reformation, we are what are we reforming back to? We are reforming back to the received truth that we have from God in the Scriptures. What is our business? Our business is to be in a constant state of reform in our godliness consistent with the knowledge of the truth received in the Scriptures. We could also go to many other places in this letter to see what our business is about. Um, For example, in chapter 2, verse 10, did you see what it said about slaves there? In chapter 2, verse 10, when he speaks of slaves, he says that they are to adorn the teaching of God our Saviour in everything. I think that's not just good advice for slaves back then. I think it was good advice for everyone, don't you? And why would you do that? Well, you've already stated why you do that. It was actually printed on the screen and you read it together. So let's do it again. Chapter 2, verse 11. Why would you do this? Because... The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who himself gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. That's why you do this. Now, I don't know if you've noticed uh, on our journey through Titus, or your journey through Titus, which I've shared from a distance, the incredible emphasis on doing good in this book. Have you noticed that? Has that been drawn to your attention over the past number of weeks? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We noticed. Thank you for that. All right. Elders in chapter 1 are to love what is good. Older men are to be worthy of respect. Older women reverent in behavior. Titus is to be an example of good works and slaves are to adorn the teaching of Christ. All of them in chapter 3 verse 1 are to be ready for every good work and the reasons are obvious, of course, aren't they? They live in a world of cretins. And even a cretin will notice that Christ makes a difference, won't they? You can't be a Christian and always lie, act evilly and be a lazy glutton. You can't do that. Become a Christian and the cretin is transformed forever, as are Aussies. 
transformed forever. Christ makes a difference. Christ transforms lives, and when you see the transformed life, it is very attractive. Is it not? For all the world's damning of Christendom today, can I say, don't be worried about that because you will shine brighter and brighter on the darkening background of our age. You will stand out if you're a transformed Christian. And so in one sense, I think we've never been in a better age to live than the age we live in currently to promote the great gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because when his people shine, it'll be obvious to everyone just how great Jesus is and what great changes Jesus can bring. People may well hate and despise Christ, but the good life of the Christian will certainly give pause to the world's criticism. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but I've said nothing about chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. <laughs> have you noticed that? I thought you might have. Tucked in between verses 12, 13, and 15, oh, no, 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 this is a revelation for you, are the words of verse 14. Do you see them there? Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Now, I don't think that little verse there is inconsistent with anything that is said in the rest of the letter to Titus. In fact, I think it's very consistent and it actually stands in opposition to, what are they? Liars, lazy gluttons and evil brutes. They're not to live unproductive lives. There's a cast back to that kind of statement. But here are Paul's closing instructions to a Titus and the church. Perhaps Paul's intention was simply to pass on some instructions about a range of things back then to people we've got no idea who they are and have little relevance to us. Is that what's going on? Is that how you would read it in your quiet time? Got to the end of a letter, a whole lot of kind of thank yous, tell such and such to do this, a few names you've never heard of before, even names that you might look at and go, actually that wouldn't be a name, bad name for my Newborn son, Tychicus, or a daughter called Zenus. Um, in fact, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if those names have already been used because people keep using weird names to name their children, don't they? Sorry. Are there any Tychicuses or Zenuses here with us this morning? If there are, I apologise. Okay. Uh, who am I to speak? I have a grandson called Kai. Spelt K-A-I. It's the Greek word for the conjunction and. So I'm still waiting for some extra grandchildren. Okay, <laughs> I just look at him and I go, and? Um, so that, that had nothing to do with the sermon. Stick with the script, Rick. Stick with the script. Here are Paul's closing instructions to Titus and the church. I remember somebody once at, when I was at college saying, oh, well, we've got to the end. It's just a series of names. You don't have to worry about them. And I thought, well, hang on a minute. Isn't this God's God-breathed word? And if it's God's God-breathed word, do I not have to do a little extra homework to work out what would this be saying to someone like me or to us as a church? And we come to this last section that's full of names and we gloss over it probably in our quiet times, but I don't want you to do that this morning because I think at the end of this letter you see that the Apostle Paul is actually a model of the message that he delivers. He models for you and for me what a good life would look like and responsible Christian living would look like, what a productive Christian life would look like. Verse 12, he says, as soon as I send Artemis and Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis because I have decided to winter there. Now Titus is to leave Crete. He's got his marching orders for Nicopolis uh, for a meeting with the apostle and the next season of his ministry. 
But did you notice that Paul will suffer without Titus until he is sure that the church in Crete is cared for by sending either Artemis or Tychicus? Did you notice that? Now, I'm not sure why Artemis and Tychicus. Perhaps that meant that Titus was actually doing the work of two people, which is usual for clergy. But it is clear that Paul cares for the church and Crete and will hold off on the pleasure of a reunion with Titus in order to make sure that the church in Crete is okay. He is committed to the good of the church in Crete and its ministry in Crete. Verse 13, do everything you can to help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need. Now, I have no idea who Zenos is, okay? But we're probably familiar with Apollos, who was a great preacher and a Christian missionary. These two are obviously traveling together in, and in Crete as they come it's likely that they are the deliverers of this letter to Titus. So they've come bringing the letter. And in a sentence, Paul looks, did you notice what Paul looks to do? Because Paul is interested in doing that which is good and Christ-honoring. Did you notice what he does? He looks to secure their welfare, and I think that's why Paul says, verse 14, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Christians are in partnership, and if there is no greater good than the world hearing of Jesus, then it has to be good for the church to be involved in missionary support. And Paul wants the Cretan church to be offering support in whatever way they can, to Apollos and Zenos. He's concerned for them. What an end. What an end to this letter. A letter that just keeps encouraging the church to be good and to adorn the teaching of Christ, that ends with its apostle exemplifying his teaching. He is not one who simply dumps on the church in Crete all these rules and regulations, all these demands to be good, and himself is somehow not characteristic of the very things he teaches. No, he is what he speaks. God help us if we get Christians who are actually inconsistent in the way they live with the speech of the proclamation of Christ. Notice where you too. I don't know if you picked it up in verse 14. Did you see there's a very important word there? Did you see it? I wonder if you picked it up. You'll be surprised when you hear what word I think is really important. Which one? What do you think? What? Must? Oh, well, that's maybe an important word. Okay, yeah, must. Devote, that's an important word. But did you see what I think is a really important word not to miss in this conclusion? Our. Did you see that? Our people. Our people. This is the apostle speaking to Titus in Crete. I'm not sure that Paul's ever spent much time in Crete. And yet... Paul embraces in his love of Christ a people to whom he sent missionaries to serve the kingdom of God. The Apostle Paul, at the very end of this letter, is not one who stands aloof from the letter, but in fact exemplifies the very heart of this letter. Your Apostle is good and he honours the things of Christ and he encourages the church to do the same. Well, that's all very interesting, isn't it? The danger of a sermon like this, and I'm about to finish. You go, oh, phew, it's about to finish. The danger of a sermon like this is that some of you will respond dangerously as you read Titus, thinking that it's not what I say that is important, but what I do. 
There's a massive danger here as we go through this letter, constantly being confronted by the doing of good. And you think, well, I'll just go out into the world and I'll do good, but I won't speak because that's scary. All right? The whole of this letter encourages the church to devote itself to the good, but devoting itself to the good is predicated upon the preaching of Christ. You don't get one without the other. To think you only have to live a good life and not speak is a despicable lie and must be repented of if you're a Christian. We may be uncomfortable about speaking for Christ because we are frightened, but I want to suggest that the fear that keeps you from speaking evidences an idolatry in your own life that you must repent of because you've become self-protective rather than God-honouring. And when you're self-protective, self takes prominence. The God of the Christian church in Crete is sovereign as he is in the Australian church. In other words, he rules even over those who would ridicule us when we speak. It is the same God, this sovereign God, who by grace rescued us from hell and eternity will confirm that you are the objects of his immeasurable love. And as the recipients of such a privilege, one can hardly claim to be good if by our silence we allow our family, our friends and our neighbours to go to hell. Friends, let's devote ourselves to doing good, but let's open our lips also to declare his praise. That indeed is what the Bible asks us to do. May God help us in this. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.